You know how it is with toddlers where they kind of assume that they can do anything that their parents can do? They want to drive, they want to cook, they want to use power tools. You know, that, and there's that phrase, of, their favorite phrase is, I can do it. You heard kids where they say that, I do it, I'll do it. And it's good for them to pretend, right? But, but it's, it's, it's kind of dangerous for them to overestimate their abilities. They need to rely upon their parents sometimes. I think the same is true for adults. We should understand that there are limits to our abilities too. Uh, we need to rely upon the Lord. But sometimes we act like toddlers. Right? We pretend that we can control everything. And we convince ourselves that, that just given enough time, I mean, this is a society-wide thing, we, we think that given enough time, human beings will solve every problem. Now, of course, in ancient times, uh, people were tempted to turn from the true God to idols, and that was a way to try to exert control over their lives. But, but what we've done, what we do in our society is that we idolize ourselves. Right? We worship at the idol of humanity and human progress. We need to hear the words of God from Isaiah 46, verse 9, where he says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Today, in our study of the Gospel of Luke, we come to a passage that addresses this issue of power and control. It's, it's Luke 4, verses 31 through 44, and it describes a series of events that happened one day in the city of Capernaum. The passage presents Jesus as the ultimate authority. And so these events uh, in the passage show us four spheres in which we should, in which we must rely upon Him. The first sphere that comes out in the passage is the sphere of knowledge. You know the old game with try as kids when you take try to make a telephone out of two tin cans and some string. And you know if the person down the hall yells loud enough, it works. Um, you know, <laughs> and in a way, I think that the human pursuit of knowledge is kind of like that same kind of game on a grander scale. I mean, isn't that what the internet is, right? It's kind of it's kind of like that. People shout, and we hear what we want to hear. <laughs> I mean, we may not want to acknowledge it, but our knowledge, our definition of truth is very subjective. We need an authority that transcends our fallible human learning. Now, going back to the time of Jesus, the, the intellectuals of his day were the Jewish rabbis. And the way that they taught, they would teach Scripture by quoting other rabbis. And so they would cite various views, and they would argue their position, and they'd try to be very articulate and deep. And so over time, they develop all of these traditional interpretations and applications that go far beyond anything in the Scripture. And so their teaching of God's Word becomes like this giant telephone game in which his message gets lost in all the noise. Jesus accuses them of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish their own tradition. So with that being the context, when Jesus comes and teaches, his teaching is radically different. Take a look at Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 32. It tells us he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. We talked a little bit about Jesus in, in, uh, in a different synagogue last week. And we talked about his view of Scripture, that he shows this complete confidence in its truthfulness and its accuracy. And when you take those convictions combined with his divine knowledge, that prompts him to speak with great authority about what is true and what is right. So that flies in the face 
of what of the rabbis were doing. Right? It was radically different. Now, since the earliest days of creation, people have been tempted to develop our own independent knowledge apart from God. I mean, think back to, to, to the story in Genesis 3. God creates Adam and Eve, and he prohibits them from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? He warns them that if they do, that they will die, but then the serpent comes to Eve, and he contradicts God. And what does it say? Genesis 3, 6. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So I think it's important to note this that even before Eve eats from the tree, she makes a choice. She chooses to ignore God's revelation and make her own determination about what is true. See, that's, it's, it's an independent pursuit of knowledge apart from God. And we all face that same temptation. I mean, some people urge us to base our understanding upon science and human wisdom, and others say, follow your heart, right? Whatever that means, to arrive at your own truth. But what does Jesus say? John 14, 6. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. He claims to be the ultimate authority of what is true. He is the embodiment of truth. And so he should be our authority in the sphere of knowledge. Now, you'll see what that means here as we, as we move on to the second sphere that comes out in the passage. It's that he shows authority over demons. Now, a lot of people in our world refuse to believe anything that can't be scientifically observed or measured. Right? In philosophical terms, we would call them materialists. That they, they don't believe anything exists that, can't, that isn't material, that isn't physical. And so from their perspective, human beings don't have souls. Right? We're just complex organic machines, and once we die, that's it. And so they would say, our feelings, our emotions, and they're nothing more than biochemical responses that serve some evolutionary purpose. Right? It's a completely secular worldview. The Bible, however, insists upon the existence of a spiritual realm. Every human being, Scripture teaches us, has an immortal soul that continues to exist after we die. And the Bible teaches us that there are spiritual beings who exist who do not have physical bodies. So God himself, the triune God, is an eternal spirit. And he created other spiritual beings. Right? We often refer to them as angels. Uh, and that term simply means messengers. Because there's rare occasions throughout the Scripture when angelic beings appear to people to reveal uh, some message from God. But we also know that there are evil spirits, right? Angels who rebelled against God, who seek to oppose His plans. And so we often refer to them as demons. Chief among them is Satan, who took the form of a serpent, as we were just talking about, to lead Adam and Eve into sin. And so, even today, Satan and his demons influence the world to such a degree that in Ephesians 6.12, the Apostle Paul said, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I know the thought of these invisible enemies, that's, kind of, that's a frightening idea, isn't it? I mean, it inspires all sorts of frightening ideas, but the problem that we have when we start to talk about uh, demons is that a lot of the uh, ideas that are out there, a lot of the thinking has no biblical support. Right? We, should, we should reject something if it's not in the Scripture. Um, so the Bible shows us that Satan and his demons are no match for the power and the purpose of God. 
And so as son of God, Jesus exercises ultimate authority over the demonic realm. And we see that here in Luke 4, verses 33 through 37. Take a look. This is the first of several encounters that Jesus had with people who were under demonic control. It tells us in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And it says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now, it's interesting to note that of all the places where you might find someone uh, controlled by a demon, Jesus finds him in the synagogue. (laughs) He finds him in, in, you might say, in church, right? He's among a group of people who are worshiping God. Now, we're not told what kind of influence he exerted over the group. But understand this, Satan seeks to deceive and mislead faithful, believing people. A lot of the silly things out in the world that people ascribe to Satan, I think are just that, they're just silly. The real influence that Satan tries to exercise is much more subtle. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 14 through 15, there Paul talks about false apostles and false prophets. He says this. He says, no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. In fact, in the Bible, this is interesting, overt demonic activity like we see here in this passage is rare. It seems to increase in response to Christ's first coming, and then again when he comes again in the future. We see it in the book of Revelation. So we have to ask then, are are demons active today? And if so, what does that mean? How do we respond? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says this. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Right? That's, that's, that's a reality. Our worldview as Christians should, uh, should include that, should reflect that. But in light of what we just read in 2 Corinthians, we have to say that Satan's primary approach is to shape the world's ideologies and values. It's to draw people into sin and then to silence their conscience so they don't feel convicted about it. Now, we also know from the stories of Job or uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. We know that at times, Satan and his demons inflict trials directly upon people in some way. So there's that. So Satan and his demons are able to possess people as what's described here in Luke 4. But that seems to be rare, and it, and it only extends to unbelievers. It seems uncommon, perhaps even unnecessary today with the level of control Satan influences over the world as a whole. And so as John speaks of evil spirits in 1 John 4.4, 4, he gives us great assurance. He says this. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Right, so this spiritual battle is real. But how do we respond? We respond by believing the gospel, by praying, by trusting in the authority of Jesus. Anything beyond that gets, gets pretty silly. Right? That's, that's the New Testament biblical response. It's the gospel. There's another sphere that comes out here in the passage where Jesus exercises his authority, and it's the sphere of health. You know, from the perspective of modern medicine, medical care from previous centuries seems 
barbaric, right? Crazy. I mean, as recently as 100 years ago, uh, some physicians thought that draining blood from someone could cure a variety of illnesses. Right? Just draining the blood out. And as, as ridiculous as that seems to us now, in the future, we may look back on current medical treatments and practices and view them the same way. Right? The Bible looks forward to a time when there will be no more sickness. And that great hope encourages us even now to recognize the authority of Jesus in the sphere of health. You know, we had talked about earlier in the Gospel of Luke, the author Luke is referred to as a physician. In Colossians 4, Paul talks about that, calls him the beloved physician. And so it should come as no surprise that he takes a special interest in those occasions when Jesus miraculously heals someone. And the first healing mentioned in his gospel is here in, in Luke 4, 38 through uh, 39. Take a look. It says of Jesus, he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fe fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. So this is Simon Peter. Uh, one of the other Gospels talks about Simon and Andrew. It's, 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 it's Peter's other-in-law. And so Matthew and Mark also record this miracle, but, but Luke's account includes some unique details. I mean, perhaps because he was a physician, Luke categorizes her fever as a great or high fever. Right? He... he thought that it was something more extreme. And he says that Jesus, he's the only one who tells us that Jesus stands over her. Perhaps it conjured in his mind the image of how a doctor would, would inspect someone, examine someone. Matthew, it's interesting, Matthew tells us that Jesus touched her hand. Mark tells us that he lifts her up. But Luke connects the moment of her recovery to Jesus rebuking her illness. And the interesting thing is, all three Gospels note that she's not only healed of her sickness, but that she immediately regains her full strength. I mean, you know how it is when you get sick. If you have a fever, normally you're, you, even when the fever breaks, you're still exhausted, right? It still takes time to, to gain, regain your strength. But she's immediately up serving. Maybe she's making dinner or something. And so Dr. Luke recognizes this as, as an amazing, powerful miracle showing the authority of Jesus. Now, since he handles her fever in the same way that he handled the demon with a rebuke, some people try to say, well, her sickness is a result of demonic activity. I mean, there are other occasions in the scripture when Jesus heals uh, a medical condition by casting out a demon. But there's no evidence of that here. He doesn't say that. We know that the presence of disease in our world can be traced all the way back, again, to Adam and Eve in the garden. Right? God created them and, and really us to live forever. But he warned them that, that death would be the consequence of their disobedience. Now, that death wasn't immediate, but once they, once, they, once they sinned, they began to experience gradually the effects of aging, and presumably that included disease. And so sickness is, is just part of life in a fallen world. It doesn't have to be demonic in origin. But even here we get the idea that God has the power to eradicate it. Right? In fact, we go back to the Old Testament and Moses, as he's leading the people of Israel, he talks about health as one of the blessings that the people would, would experience if they obeyed God. Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 15 here. It says, The Lord will take away from you all sickness, and none of the evil diseases of Egypt which you knew will he inflict on you, but he will lay them on all who hate you. See, the problem is, Israel was never able to obey God. They never experienced that blessing. 
right? Because they, they kept falling into sin. And really what this is pointing to is it's pointing ahead. For people to experience this kind of blessing, the health that God wants to to pour out on us, a dramatic transformation has to take place. Atonement has to be made for our sins. Hearts need to be transformed. Ultimately, the entire heaven and earth needs to be remade. And so Isaiah 53, when it looks ahead and talks about the coming of Christ, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, it says this, Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. See, the healing that Isaiah talks about, is, and that's not just a metaphor for spiritual change. Jesus will ultimately bring about, part of his work of salvation is bringing about physical healing at his second coming. He changes the world. He changes life as we know it. So getting back to our passage, miracles like the healing of Simon's mother-in-law here, it's a preview. It's a preview of his kingdom. It's a sign that confirms the authority that Jesus has over sickness and death. And so we have passages like Hebrews 2, verse 4, that tells us that Jesus and the apostles preached. And then it says, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. You see, it served this purpose. To, it, it showed the power of Christ. And once that sign was given, once his authority was confirmed then the sign is no longer needed, right? We're waiting for the, fulfill, the ultimate fulfillment. So I would say we shouldn't expect church leaders today to have miraculous healing power. Yet, at the same time, that's not to say that the power and authority that Jesus has over disease has diminished in any way. He hears us when we pray, and he may choose to heal us in ways that doctors won't be able to explain. So when we encounter sickness, when we're, we're dealing with, with disease, we take full advantage of modern medicine. That is a blessing, but we should always trust the power of Christ first and foremost. There's one more sphere that comes out in the passage in which Jesus exercises his authority. It's the sphere of destiny. You know, life is full of choices. And it takes wisdom and foresight to see where uh, our decisions will ultimately lead us. The problem is, is we seldom look far enough ahead. I mean, when you're, when you're in school, you're thinking ahead to what, you're, uh, what sort of career you want to pursue. And, and then maybe once you get into your career, you start at some point thinking about retirement but the Bible challenges you to look farther ahead than that, right? It challenges you to look ahead and think about your eternal destiny. But if we do that, when we start to think in that way, we realize that we're already on the wrong track. We've already made too many wrong choices, right? We've placed ourselves on sinful paths that lead us away from God. And so we need to be rescued. We need someone with the power to reshape our destiny. And Jesus has that authority. Now, throughout his ministry, people, people recognize his authority over knowledge. They come to him to learn. They recognize his authority over demons, and they come for, for help with that. And, and they recognize his authority over health. They want to be healed. And he gives immediate answers to them in those areas. So they try to persuade him to focus all of his time on those concerns. But he refuses. Take a look at Luke 4, verses 40 through 44. It tells us the story. The end of the day here in Capernaum, it says, Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, 
And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So Jesus doesn't allow people to divert his focus from the kingdom. I mean, they have urgent needs. But he's more concerned about their final destiny. I mean, the truth is no one will be able to enter his eternal kingdom without hearing the gospel. They must believe. They must be born again. And so preaching is his priority. It's very clear here. And Paul demonstrates the same priority. He argues for it in Romans 10, verse 14, by saying this, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? See, these people, as they're coming to Jesus and seeking healing, they don't realize that if he devotes all of his time to fulfilling their requests, that they're going to pull him away from his true mission. But the demons, they do understand that. At first glance, doesn't it seem strange that they identify Jesus correctly? I mean, you look back up at verse 34, they call him, uh, the, the man there calls him the Holy One of God. And then here, verse 41, they call him the Son of God. And Luke adds that they know that he is the Christ. I mean, those things are all true, right? They were ahead of everyone else. Why would they do that? I think their strategy is to stir up the crowds. Because Jesus is heading toward the cross, right? He's going to offer his life as the perfect atonement for sins. But Satan and his demons want to derail that mission. Perhaps they thought that they could get people to fight for him, right? to protect him from the cross. So what does Jesus do? He silences them. He exercises his authority over demons to stay on track with his own destiny, to be the savior of the world. And Jesus goes on to fulfill his mission in every way. He preaches the gospel. He offers up his life on the cross. Right? He rises from the dead. And ascends into heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit and he empowers his followers to continue preaching the gospel so that the church of Christ is is built. And we know that one day he will return to earth to reign as king. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 25 through 26. He says, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And Revelation 22, 3 through 5, describes the ultimate outcome of his reign. It says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. It says, Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever endeavor. Is that your destiny? Are you on that track? I mean, that's, that's the great hope that's promised to all who trust in Jesus. I mean, because of his life, death, and resurrection, he has full authority given to him from his heavenly Father to grant you eternal life. So Jesus is the ultimate authority over knowledge, over what is true and right, over the demonic realm, over health, the physical world. 
and over eternity, over our destiny. So if he has that authority, do you relate to him as your king? Have you personally bowed the knee before him? Is he reigning in your life? If not, I encourage you to to bow before him, to, to accept him, to receive him as your king. I mean, the world tells us to to trust ourselves for all the answers. It tells us to bow to no one, right? But you look out at the world, and it's a mess. Go back to Genesis 3. Read about our fall into sin. The secular view of human progress and advancement, it's not true, right? It's a a lie. The biblical worldview is is the only one that accurately describes what we see in the world today, the sinfulness of the human heart and the salvation that we need that's only found in Christ. That's why we're taught to pray for the kingdom to come. Now, if if you believe in Jesus, my question then is, are are you trusting him? Are you relying upon him to carry you through this fallen world? Are you confident in his authority over all of those spheres we've talked about today and other ones? Do you need to reaffirm your trust in him? Maybe there's some circumstance in your life that where you're looking elsewhere for help. It could be a relational thing. It could be your marriage. It could be a health thing or whatever. Are you looking to him? Are you seeking him? Are you praying, asking for his help? Maybe you'd benefit from memorizing that verse from 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you're from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The power of God is at work in our lives. And we trust in him. May God supply what's lacking in our faith.